We're going to turn quickly now to our panel. Uh, we have um, uh, Akwe Amosu of the Open Society Institute, who leads their Africa programs here in Washington, D.C., former journalist, uh, really such an insightful um, analyst of, of all things African. Uh, and Chris Vumunio, I think all of you know Chris uh, from the National Democratic Institute, uh, lead advisor on Africa and um, West and Central Africa. Uh, uh, again, someone very thoughtful who was in Cote d'Ivoire uh, during uh, the elections and has followed that intensively. Why don't, uh, Chris and Akwe, why don't you come up and we'll um, begin here. So And I just want to thank the audience for the, 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 the range of questions submitted, and I'm, I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. Um, I hope this session we're going to keep presentations fairly short so that we get a bit more interaction and, and discussion uh, between the two. I think we'll start with Akwe, um, who's going to talk a bit about really, you know, the, the human side of this, of what's happening in, in Cote d'Ivoire. And I think, in, uh, as I said at the outset, in all the issues of the test of democratic principles and um, uh, conflict prevention and international governance, um, really at the core of this is the Ivoirian people. And, and so Akwe, I think, will focus on that situation immediately, uh, that immediate situation and perhaps going forward. And then Chris will put um, put this into a broader um, uh, the broader context of the bigger implications, uh, both for Cote d'Ivoire, I think, in the future of Cote d'Ivoire, um, but the broader region as well. So, Akwe, why don't we turn to you first? Thanks. Thank you very much, Den, and for your kind introduction. Yes, uh, how often have we ever seen ECOWAS, the African Union, the U.S the EU, the UN, global NGOs, African civil society, all agreeing about a, a situation uh, anywhere, but certainly not in Africa. Uh, it's extraordinarily rare to see this kind of unanimity. And uh, Washington being a town of policy wonks, I'm sure that the majority of people are gripped. And I think the size of the crowd is a testament to that. Uh, to understand, you know, how, does, how do we come out of this um, it, it, if we've got it, usually, there's somebody who we can point to as the obstacle, the rock in the road. Uh, in this situation, I think it's a lot more complicated and it's, it is genuinely fascinating. But uh, I'm very happy to say that Chris, that's Chris's job to yeah. talk about that. Um, uh, what I want to do is to take a few minutes to focus, uh, as Jen said, on the human consequences uh, of, of this battle of wills, um, because it's about much, much more than politics. Since this crisis began at the end of November, there's been a steadily increasing incidence of violent abuse. Uh, according to Human Rights Watch, uh, pro Gbagbo security forces and unofficial militia, militia have been conducting regular raids at night, snatching people perceived to be Watara supporters from uh, pro Watara areas like uh, Abubo, uh, taking them away to unknown locations. Bodies are later found or simply never turn up. Uh, and even as early as December the 23rd, uh, the UN uh, Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, said that UN human rights monitors had reported 173 killings. So that's just uh, over a month after the, or just under a month after the election, that we were already seeing 173 uh, individual killings, 90 <laughs> cases of torture or abusive treatment, 24 forced disappearances, and hundreds and hundreds of arrests. Uh, and at least 20 of those people, by the way, were killed when security forces fired live ammunition at a demonstration on December the 16th. A week ago, the number of people killed had risen to 210. And today, uh, there's been a statement, uh, again, from the UN saying that the number is now up to 247, with 49 people unaccounted for. But as Ali Untin said to me, the president of the civil society group, Radu, uh, in an email yesterday, the death toll is almost certainly a lot higher than that, uh, and in his view, has certainly exceeded 300. There are reports of three mass graves, one reportedly with 60 to 80 bodies in it, one with, with some 30, apparently, and a third, nobody knows how many there are. Uh, the UN has been prevented from investigating any of these sites. 
uh, or where they've managed to get to any, anywhere that's been cited, they, things have been cleared away. Uh, and so there isn't any independent verification for these kinds of, of allegations. And I, one should be obviously careful to say uh, that nobody knows precisely what the facts are. But I don't think anybody really is in any doubt now about the scale uh, and the trajectory of this kind of, 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 um, a, 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 of violence. And perhaps important also to note that it's not just individuals who support President Ouattara uh, who are being targeted. We're now seeing a real pattern of attacks on the UN's uh, uh, mission there. So uh, I believe they've said today six specific attacks uh, taking place, but they're not just somebody lobbing stones. We're seeing vehicles being burned. A, a doctor and a driver of an ambulance were, were injured in one such attack recently. Uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, a, 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 a mob uh, or a militia, depending on your definition, held up. Uh, a, a vehicle carrying supplies to that hotel um, and to other for other UN uh, uses, uh, stood and then uh, stood by and, and, and allowed people to loot the contents. You're seeing a level of impunity against a, a, an independent and neutral body, uh, which I think we should all be extraordinarily concerned about as this situation continues. Um, and uh, th this, you know. Listening to uh, President Ouattara's timetable just now uh, of saying, well, you know, he's going to make some decisions next week and we're heading for a review at the end of the month. I think, again, I, refer, I bring you back to the human factor. You've got to consider if this is the trajectory, uh, then, you know, what will be the situation in two or three weeks' time? And, and I, I would I'll, I'll jump ahead and quote uh, from Valerie Amos. Uh, the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, who, who said the violence has already caused a tenfold increase in internal displacement in the space of a few days, showing how quickly a political crisis can have grave humanitarian consequences. And, and just to focus a little bit on uh, the broader question of displacement, uh, it's just obviously no surprise that people are beginning to run away. Um, I think, uh, I, unless there have been new figures today, the last figures that I saw suggested that uh, 23,500 people have crossed the border into neighboring countries, the vast majority of those into Liberia, in the past five weeks, at, and, and lately at a rate of about 600 a day. Uh, an estimated 16,000 people are displaced but still within uh, Western uh, Côte d'Ivoire. So, nearly 40,000 people uprooted, and I would suggest many more to come. And if you, uh, it's all ha always hard to think in terms of these numbers, but I found this uh, uh, sort of helpful, this grim statistic. Uh, UNHCR started to build a new camp uh, near the Liberi Liberian town of Ban. And to do it, the planners and the local community are clearing 80 hectares or 200 acres of land just to accommodate 18,000 people. So I think you get a sense of the kind of impacts we're talking about if this is not resolved fairly quickly. I think um, it, it's clear that it's a big challenge to work out what should happen now. But I wouldn't say that there, that there, are, there are no useful things to do. I think the question of the effectiveness of, the, of, of economic sanctions uh, rather financial sanctions at this point, uh, and, and the possibility of developing economic sanctions um, and, and a program of uh, targeted individual sanctions, there's still room in that space. And I think for many of us, it looks like the most promising um, path to take. Uh, and I think one of the questions that we've been discussing, I and my colleagues, is the extent to which we think that the political uh, um, team in ECOWAS and the AU is supported by an adequate team of financial experts and people who are knowledgeable in the processes that need to be engaged. Uh, it, it might sound obvious, but sometimes these conversations take place without the right people in the room. And I think anybody who's in a position to you know, identify what resources are needed and make sure that there is a kind of awareness among diplomats and, and bureaucrats about what they lack and what they need to add to this process, I think that would be extremely helpful. 
Um, I'm sure that the AU plans to confirm that President Ouattara is the uh, legitimate president at the forthcoming summit in Addis Ababa, uh, and, and also to endorse ECOWAS decisions. Uh, these small acts of, of you know, reinforcing the unanimity are not negligible, particularly as time goes by, and it doesn't seem as though there are uh, uh, solutions in hand. Um, I think the, the, on the military front, I'm, I'm not going to take a position over whether there should be a military intervention to uh, unseat Bagbo, but I, I, I note that the chiefs of staff are, are meeting next week in Bamako uh, to discuss strategies, and, and uh, it seems to me that there's a, it, it perhaps was a mistake, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, to um, firmly say that economic, um, military action was on the table uh, if internally soundings hadn't been taken within ECOWAS to make sure that everybody was on board with that. Perhaps that would never have happened. Nonetheless, I think it's extraordinarily important that people shouldn't then be demobilized and say, oh, well, we can't make a decision because some of us don't agree. There are several other uh, critical factors that, for example, if you're trying to prevent getting arms and, 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 and uh, mercenaries getting into the country, you've got to monitor that. To what extent is there an effective monitoring machine uh, around the borders and internally? Is it possible to beef that up to strengthen that? Is it possible that uh, West African militaries are doing enough in terms of engaging th uh, their counterparts in the Ivorian military about what they're doing, about what the consequences might be, uh, and if not, there is an area that can be strengthened. And then what about the countries like Angola that have been very supportive to uh, Gbagbo? You know, uh, very rich, plenty of oil, no shortage of, of uh, op opportunity to supply uh, <laughs> materiel. So to what extent is that being monitored? To what extent is the Angolan government being engaged? It seems to me that, uh, that the, all these things should be on the table for a sort of intensification and, and, and focus. Um, I think... It's not just about, uh, going back to the point we made at the beginning, it's not just about uh, putting the rightful government in place. As these days go by, and we are, we are seeing um, the da da damage done to the standing of um, the UN's force in the country, it may well be the case that we're going to come to the point of view that there is a need, an urgent need to ratchet up protection for civilians in Cote d'Ivoire, but that, there is, there, that it is difficult for the UN to do that. ECOWAS has to engage with that problem too. Uh, and it seems to me that when they discuss next week, they need not to just think in terms of uh, a, a kind of a mission to uh, uh, change the power, but to think about the broader questions of protection, not just also in, in Abidjan, but around the country and around the borders. Um, and then finally, I wanted to just say something about accountability. Um, the UN Security Council has stressed that those responsible for these kinds of crimes uh, against both civilians and um, UN personnel uh, must be held accountable. You've seen uh, the ICC prosecutor. You've seen uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Madame Pillay, all make warnings. I'm still wanting to hear a stronger uh, call from African leaders about accountability. Uh, I know, and we all understand and know that there is ambivalence about the ICC, not to put too fine a point on it, but at the same time, accountability is not only delivered by the ICC. There is, isn't a, a, is a responsibility throughout the continent uh, to the civilians um, of, of Côte d'Ivoire that's enshrined in the African Union statutes and, in, and especially in ECOWAS statutes. And so I think uh, the, 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 the message to those who are perpetrating these actions in Côte d'Ivoire that there is going to be uh, a process for holding people accountable and that this information is being collected and documented is absolutely critical and needs to be said much more loudly and much more frequently, in my view, just to make sure that if it can have a deterrent effect, uh, that, that, that it will do so in, in the coming days and weeks. Thanks very much. Thank Chris, why don't we turn to you? <coughs> so, you know, I, uh, I was thinking to myself, you know, it's, it's a challenge for the panel to come after... Um, the very eloquent and, and very thoughtful president-elect of Côte d'Ivoire, uh, uh, President Alassane Ouattara. Um, little did I know that I would speak after, uh, <laughs> you know, Akria Musu, which <laughs> makes the task even much harder for me. <laughs> um, however, I thought I should just put three points on the table. Um, 
so that we open this up for, for, for that discussion and have a more interactive session. Um, I really like uh, uh, Akwe's emphasis on the human dimension because some of that gets lost when we look at power politics and the power play that's currently uh, underway in, uh, in, in Abidjan. Um, and just the, the line that I take from that story is that when you have uh, over 20,000 Ivorians crossing the border into a country like Liberia, uh, it's very telling about the current conditions within Cote d'Ivoire, and I'm really hoping that we can all collectively do something about it to bring this to closure uh, before it gets eclipsed by yet another African or global crisis. Uh, the three points I wanted to make are, firstly, that we have to find some ways to recognize the Ivorian voices uh, through this entire process. Uh, because we can't forget that over 5.7, close to 6 million Ivorians registered to uh, participate in the elections, that between 4 to 5 million, depending on whose uh, count you take, uh, actually participated in those elections, went to the polls, and actually voted because they believed very strongly that elections matter. Uh, you needed to have seen the level of voter mobilization the number of people who came out, and how peaceful, relatively peaceful, uh, the campaign period was. Um, in fact, uh, for many of us who have worked on, on Cote d'Ivoire for many years, and NDI has been in Cote d'Ivoire on and off since uh, the early 90s, um, I think 2010 was one of the most hopeful years in the lives of Ivorians, especially in that last week uh, between uh, November 25th, Thursday, November 25th, when the two candidates, the, the two candidates had a presidential debate and all pledged to respect the outcome of the elections. And Thursday, December 3rd, when the wrangling began between the Constitutional Council and the Independent Election Commission of Cote d'Ivoire. A lot of good things did happen through this electoral process in 2010 that really underscored or captured the attachment of the people of Cote d'Ivoire to democratic principles and practices. Uh, it's not just the voter turnout, it's the work that was done by women's groups uh, to call for peaceful elections, it's the work that was done by domestic uh, election observers, um, Ivorians from civil society organizations who were fiscally present in uh, over 40 percent of the polling sites, which is a huge sample for any country. Um, because they were really committed to making a contribution uh, to make sure that these elections could be uh, properly conducted. I think these Ivorians uh, want to believe that elections mean something. Um, and I think that a solution that is found that reasserts that feeling would go a long ways to uh, reinforcing their commitment to democratic governance. Uh, however the outcome, or whatever the outcome of this would be, uh, the, the, the readout we take from, from this experience is that Cote d'Ivoire is going to require a lot of institutional reform. Because as we speak, a number of institutions, state institutions, have had their credibility put on the line, haven't performed as well as many Advarians had believed they would perform. And I think in the years ahead, there's going to have to be a concerted effort uh, to undertake institutional reform, national reconciliation, and national um, reconstruction as well in order to restore citizen confidence in democratic governance in Cote d'Ivoire. My second point is that I think collectively um, everyone's credibility is on the line with regards to Cote d'Ivoire. It's not just the credibility of Ivorian political actors uh, and their commitment to democracy and we've seen all too often in a number of African countries where people have been good Democrats when they were in opposition uh, but once they get into power, begin to change the rules of the game. Uh, it's the credibility of these political actors that is on the line. It's also the credibility of institutions, uh, such as the respectability of the Independent Election Commission, the credibility of the Constitutional Council. And when you go beyond the borders of Cote d'Ivoire, uh, you start looking at the regional bodies, ECOWAS and its protocols. And to ECOWAS's credit, they have at least stepped up to the task. You look at the African Union, uh, which in 2007 adopted a charter at, at the General Assembly meeting in Addis, which is a very progressive document, uh, which talks to the need for credible elections and transparent governance, uh, democratic governance, uh, but which charter has still not been ratified because um, not many countries have signed off 
to ratify the charter. Um, and that begs the question as to the level of co commitment uh, within the organization. Thankfully, the African Union has also stepped up to the plate and, have become, and, and has become very outspoken with regards to the President's stalemate in Cote d'Ivoire. But ultimately, at some point, the African Union is going to have to address the fact that this could be a watershed moment for the credibility of regional organizations. And then you look at the entire UN system, uh, the fact that the UN had 10,000, close to 10,000 peacekeepers in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, that the UN had accompanied the Ivorians as they went through various um, peace uh, processes, trying to get peace accords that would create an environment uh, for Cote d'Ivoire to become a post-conflict, uh, to, to come out of conflict, um, to the point where the certification process was introduced as a means of building confidence amongst Ivorians and especially the stakeholders that the outcome of the election would be one that would reflect the will of the Ivorian people. And you look at the UN Security Council and the number of resolutions that have been passed and the fact that countries around the world are also watching to see whether Cote d'Ivoire takes these resolutions seriously. Because if that is not the case, then the repercussions are going to be much larger than we could ever imagine. And so I would say that collectively, there's a lot riding on the line with regards to the Cote d'Ivoire crisis and um, the credibility of organizations and entities that have been involved with trying to get this resolved. The third and last point that I would say is that um, all of Africa is really watching what's going on in, in Cote d'Ivoire. And many of you have written, some of you have written, and many of you are aware of the fact that in 2011, uh, we expect to have 17 or 18 national elections in Africa, many of which would be very competitive, uh, some of which would be in uh, contentious environments. Um, but elections that are being uh, conducted by people who are waiting to read the final um, lesson from the Ivorian uh, situation. Uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, uh, Benin, for example, will be having uh, its presidential election, an election which could be very competitive. Uh, the Central African Republic will be having elections in a few days' time uh, in, a conf in a country that has not fully emerged from conflict uh, when the central government is still not controlling the entire territory of the country. Uh, Nigeria is, is the big kid on the block. It, it's the uh, ruling party had its primaries early this morning, uh, but Nigeria will be moving into, and Nigeria will be moving into national elections by April of this year. Uh, Liberia, which is next door to Cote d'Ivoire, which is already absorbing all of these refugees that we've talked about, um, is preparing for national elections at the end of this year. So you can go down the list of African countries uh, that are coming up with elections, and the obvious um, lesson is going to be, or the obvious conclusion is going to be that if Cote d'Ivoire gets it right, if the issues in Cote d'Ivoire get resolved in a way that confirm to African Democrats that elections mean something, then we're going to see an increase or the likelihood of better elections across the African continent, elections in which citizens will participate fully, knowing that the will of the citizens will be respected by all of the political actors. On the other hand, if Cote d'Ivoire doesn't get resolved properly, uh, then I think that Democrats across the African continent can pick their marble and go home because there's going to be no incentive for a sitting president, an incumbent, uh, with all of the attributes of incumbency on the continent to put in place a, a fair electoral process that would allow citizens uh, to participate freely and for their voices to be heard, let alone to hand over power if they so lose an election. These are some of the points that I wanted to highlight, and uh, I think as we move into an interactive uh, session, I'll be ready to uh, take your questions as well. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks so much to both of you. Um, I wanted to, you know, the United States um, uh, has, response has been pretty remarkable. The, the uh, engagement, personal engagement by President Obama, who has twice tried to call uh, President Bagbo really standing very firmly, I think, behind the leadership of ECOWAS and the African Union. Um, U.S. Cote d'Ivoire has, you know, it's near and dear to many of our hearts, but it's never figured particularly high on uh, U.S. policy agenda. I think the the intense uh, effort right now is kind of a reflection 
of the things that Chris was saying, how, how, how important this is for, for so many other things um, in the region um, and going forward. So in the midst of the historic referendum um, in Sudan, which has major public constituencies here in the, in the United States and has been uh, the, a process of intensive U.S. diplomacy, uh, the attention that Cote d'Ivoire is getting, I think, is, is really laudable and um, uh, really quite remarkable. We have someone here from the State Department, and I, I was going to just quickly ask Jason um, Small to uh, uh, say a few words about where the U.S. is in its thinking. Just a brief intervention, and then we'll open up for um, questions and answers from the audience. Jason, do you want to come up, or do you want to stand from the audience, and um, uh, use a mic will come to you. And thanks so much for uh, agreeing just to say a few words. Great, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. A very good presentation uh, so far we've had here. Um, let, me, let me just say that if you had told me a year ago that we would have elections in Cote d'Ivoire and that we'd have the political crisis, I wouldn't have believed you. Um, yeah, I've, here we've been losing sleep over Guinea, and uh, we should have been losing sleep over Cote d'Ivoire here. Um, certainly, I think you know, this has been a very important issue for this administration for, for a whole number of reasons, and some of which have already been mentioned. I mean, the fact that we're having 17 national or presidential elections throughout Africa in 2011, what happens here in Cote d'Ivoire is going to resonate across the, across the continent. And of course, one of the countries I follow very closely is Nigeria, and that's, that's a big election, and it's very important. And so what happens here matters a lot to what will happen in Nigeria as well. And so there has been very, very high level attention. In fact, I've been told that uh, President Obama asked about Cote d'Ivoire almost on a daily basis. So that, it continues to, to resonate at, at that level. Um, in terms of U.S. policy, U.S. policy starts from the premise that President Ouattara is the president-elect of Cote d'Ivoire. Um, that's where it starts, and everything where we go well, and everything that we've been doing flows from that premise. Um, and, and certainly it's been remarkable the amount of uh, unity that we've seen across the international community, uh, both within Africa through ECOWAS and the African Union, um, but also internationally, the number of countries that have come together and, and through the UN bodies uh, in terms of support for, for this premise. Um, just a couple of things that uh, the U.S. Uh, has been focused on in, in particular. Um, some of have been mentioned, uh, certainly the, the financial pressure uh, option here, which has been focused both on uh, targeted sanctions, whether they be travel bans uh, on uh, 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 former President Bagbo and his uh, inner circle, as well as uh, asset freezes, which we did uh, just about a week ago uh, on the five, five of himself and, five other, and four other individuals uh, around him. Those are mirrored in the European Union as well, and so it makes it very difficult for, um, for those individuals to uh, transact uh, any, any financial transactions at all or for U.S. companies or U.S. persons to be involved with any of those individuals. And so it's, it's a particularly important piece of pressure that we've continued to, to, to uh, apply. Uh, also, we've all granted yesterday uh, agreement to uh, President Ouattara's ambassador-designate uh, to the United States. And again, it flows from the, from the premise that President Ouattara is, in fact, uh, the president of, of Cote d'Ivoire. Um, you know, other areas we continue to work uh, to build and sustain the coalition uh, and the strong unity and support there has been for, uh, for uh, President Ouattara assuming uh, all the powers of the presidency and, and begin to carry out his term as, as he so rightfully wants to do. Um, but at the same time, we've, we've ha had outreach to, uh, to President Bagbo. As was mentioned, uh, President Obama tried to reach him on two occasions. Um, and have, have also offered him, as well as, as some, several other countries, what we like to call the soft landing, an honorable exit for him uh, to take up uh, you know, a role as a former African president. Um, I thought, we thought it was quite uh, good that President Obasanjo, himself a former African president who has found a very successful uh, career following uh, his presidency of Nigeria, uh, to, to, to convey a message that, that life does exist after, uh, after you, you leave office. And so, uh, all of these efforts are, are, are continuing. We continue to work very closely with ECOWAS and with the African Union. And uh, our hope is that in, in the near term, we'll be able to find a peaceful transition uh, that will allow um, President Ouattara to fully assume the duties and powers of his office. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Jason. Um, let's turn to our audience that's been very patient throughout this process. Um, and let's take a couple of questions, perhaps uh, together. Um, so we have Ni uh, there. We have the gentleman in the front row, and then we'll go to the very I, I, back row there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ni Akwete. Um, 
I have a two-part question. Um, the first actually will go to the State Department representative. And if you could keep the mic close. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was going to talk about the financial um, sanctions on people around Mr. Gbagbo uh, because uh, I thought the American list is smaller than the European Union list. So why the discrepancy? But also, I mean, are you talking to uh, an African country like Angola, who I know that have been trying to have close relations with the US, but they are one of the few African countries that you can tell is supporting the wrong side. So what is the US saying to them? Now for Chris and Akwe, I was wondering if you can contrast the attitude of the government of the two neighbors, Ghana versus Liberia. It seems to me Liberia is more vulnerable, but they've been stronger versus Ghana, which seems to be backpedaling. So what's your read of especially what, what's happening in Ghana? Why Ghana is taking such a, what I consider to be an unusual position, given it's Mr. Obama going there and them getting credit for being strong on democracy. And here they seem to be taking the wrong side. Thank you. Excellent question that uh, well Chris or Akwe can tackle <laughs> uh, if they want. Or I can. Um, yes, the gentleman here in the front row, and please identify yourself. Uh, Amir Osman. I'm with Save Darfur uh, slash Genocide Intervention Network. Um, uh, two quick questions. The first to Akwe. We have heard the reports about the movement of uh, militias from Liberia and Sierra Leone into uh, Cote d'Ivoire, how serious is this and what could be done to stop it because uh, mainly I think this is disturbing to see malicious movement within African countries. And the second question is about the international community's response and in particular the, the U current U.S. administration about being firm and, and speaking publicly about what should be done. We have seen elections during the past years in Africa and unfortunately we didn't see the Obama administration uh, being critical on the results of these elections, for example, Sudan and Ethiopia, and we are seeing, as uh, Chris said, uh, another 18 elections, um, most of which I think there would be irregularities during the conduct of the elections, in particular Egypt and, and Uganda. Should we expect the Obama administration to be uh, similarly firm on how this should be conducted? Thanks. Good question as well. Um, and the gentleman in the, uh, the far Thank you, uh, Elliot Pence with the Whitaker Group. Thanks to the panelists and, and, and uh, Jennifer for a wonderful panel. Uh, my question is brief. Um, the political actors that have been brought in to um, compel Bagbo out uh, have broadly failed. What's the next approach? Who has sufficient capital to compel Bagbo? Have we reached into the civil society communities, the religious communities? Is the State Department thinking on those lines, or thanks. Let, let's start with that round, and um, uh, and then we'll come back for another. Um, Akwe, do you want to take on the the uh, first shot at the Ghana versus Liberia approaches <laughs> <laughs> and the outflow of refugees? Um, yeah, and then uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, I, I wouldn't claim to have, you know, a, a really um, informed insight. I can, I can only say that I think if you've been through a very serious conflict, and Liberia has uh, very recently, it knows what the price of failure here is. I think Ghana, uh, for very, very good reasons, um, or, or rather, I should say, President Atta Mills is uneasy about the consequences um, of seeing a major war or, or, or major conflict in which uh, his troops are involved uh, right there on the border. He, will, he doesn't know how he's going to set a limit on that, never having you know, had to re come out of such a situation, he, his strongest instinct may well be to just hold it back. But I think from the Liberian side, you know, they, they, are, they are veterans in this and recognize that, in fact, stopping this process early, nipping, well, probably nipping in the bud is, is certainly not a good expression, but uh, trying to uh, prevent the situation getting worse by recognizing the possibility that some kind of military intervention might be needed uh, if it's planned well and effective. Uh, that I don't find it that surprising, perhaps is all I'm saying, 
that that's that that contrast should be there but i think you know very neighboring countries have the best reasons and liberia too for not wanting there to be a, a war and if you know uh, ellen johnson sirleaf is you know looking at this situation and saying it, you know in in the twinkling of an eye i will be back where where this country was you know 10 years ago she will be absolutely desperate to prevent that happening with and with the enormous losses that they would be taking so i don't know do you want to comment on that one, or, or Adam? Yeah, I, um, of course, let me first, on the Angola question, by the way, I, you know, it was very awkward that, that the swearing in of uh, Laurent Gbagbo that was staged by the Constitutional Council the very next day after the announcement, uh, there were only two amb ambassadors uh, represent, uh, present. That was the ambassador of Angola and the ambassador of Lebanon. Um, it was very telling. Um, in terms of Ghana, I, 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 I wouldn't be surprised if there are internal dynamics within the ruling party in Ghana uh, that may be making President Atamiels a little uncomfortable about being so upfront about a military option in, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, we should remember that the NDC in Ghana is, is part of the socialist international family uh, to which the FPI in Cote d'Ivoire belongs. And that the West African or the African chapter of the Socialist International, which is headed by uh, Tano Dieng of Senegal, has not distanced itself publicly from Laurent Gbagbo the way that the French Socialist Party has done. Um, and that also within the NDC, there are some rumblings of people to the left of Atamiels that may be preparing to challenge him in the next primaries uh, when Ghana prepares for his presidential elections. I don't know if all of that is playing into his decision-making with regards to Cote d'Ivoire. Also, let's, know, let's acknowledge that Ghana has been uh, very heavily involved in peacekeeping missions around the world. And uh, when he says, the president of Ghana says they're overstretched, uh, that could be uh, a matter of fact. They could really be overstretched. Uh, and thirdly, I would just say that, um, as uh, President-elect Alassane Ouattara said, uh, Ghana has been burnt in Cote d'Ivoire before. Uh, some of us may remember uh, some of the riots when Ivorians took on Ghanaians and said Ghana must go. Um, and Ghanaians lost a lot in Cote d'Ivoire, and um, I, that generation is still alive and active, and I'm sure a lot of Ghanaians wouldn't want to get caught up in the internal politics of Cote d'Ivoire. So I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing here, but all of these elements could be at play. Um, with regards to... And I could probably just yeah. skip to the um, well, well, let's third talk about question. Okay. What about future elections? Why this election has galvanized this remarkable unity, perhaps? And I think and from yes. the United States, I think you could ask the same questions of the African Union. Why, mm. why is it this election uh, versus the election in, in Ethiopia, for example, or, or other very flawed elections? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, why is it this election that is focused the um, uh, U.S. did not react in a similar way for the Ethiopian elections, for example, but neither did the African Union. And, and what is it about this election um, uh, in particular? Is, is it the destabilizing consequences? So I'll, and then I think the next question was, who will be next? Kind of what's next in terms of mediation? And then we'll, we'll get you to answer on the lists in the Angola uh, question. So that wasn't a very organized um, <laughs> moderation here by Akre. <laughs> Why this election and for the U.S. and others? This election. I mean, I, you know, uh, well, one thing that I think is important and people often under, under, underestimate is that you know, there are many reasons why standing up on a particular election can be difficult. You know, you, if you don't feel that the data is solid, for example, you know, and you're going to come in and say, you know, very definitely that that was an unfair result, or if you think that the results are extremely close and that, that, that they're so close that it's difficult to be clear and, you know, know that one side won. I think this election... Uh, it was a very categorical result. I don't think any, there was no challenge that was laid uh, at, at the, these results could have changed them. Um, it, nothing that the Bagbo side put there. So I think that made it very safe for everybody. Uh, he was an incumbent. That, that, that also made it very, very clear. Uh, usually what happens is that, you know, um, the incumbent wins, but only just. And th that, that's a much heavier lift for outside governments than 
to, to say an incumbent, com, you know, definitively lost, he should leave power. That's much easier. And so, I mean, I, I think that's one of the reasons. I think the calculus also, is, as, as, you know, it has not escaped other people's notice either, that we're at the beginning of a year of many elections, and that many of those are, look vulnerable, and that it feels like, you know, time to draw a line in the sand, or else spend a year of having no sleep, um, and, and probably with, with less chance in each case of, you know, prevailing. So, you know, sticking here and trying to make this one work uh, makes very good sense in, in terms of international politics. So that, that would be my, my answer to that question. Did you want me to ask, yeah. answer Amir's question as well? Yeah. I, I mean, I, the short answer is I don't have um, detail. If, if your question about how serious is it is how many people are involved and, and what's the scale of the, the, the remobilization of these fighting men uh, in, in the region, I don't know. What I am very sure about is that once people spend their lives making their living from one form, one, one byproduct of conflict or another, it's really hard to reintegrate into civilian life. And even now, after all the time that has passed in Liberia, there are people uh, who are, to some extent, outside of society. It's hard to reintegrate. And the prospect of being able to return to the, to the old firm, as it were, to take on a, a kind of form of economic activity that they know very well and know how to leverage effectively is, is going to be very attractive. And that's why I made the point earlier about the critical importance of monitoring. It's no use having an embargo in place or having you know, a formal position against mercenaries, but not having the people on the ground to monitor, not having <laughs> the data to be able to demonstrate to the governments at the, uh, around uh, in the region that their people are involved. And so it seems to me absolutely critical. In that sense, I think it's very serious. I think it's absolutely critical that that should get special attention and, if necessary, international support so that we do actually know what is the position on the ground. At the moment, so, so far as I'm aware, it's all anecdotal. Yeah, I, I think um, we have to remember that these elections were supposed to have been held in 2005. Um, and that uh, between 2005 and 2010, um, a lot of actors were very patient and understood that you needed to go through various peace accords to get the parties to the table. Um, there was a lot of African countries, including the ECOWAS countries, have invested a lot in this process by putting troops into Cote d'Ivoire to help the peace, uh, peacemaking or, or peacekeeping between the rebels in the north and Bagbo's government. So I think there was a sense that these investments could not be allowed to go for naught. And that having waited for five long years and finally created an environment uh, which had everything going for it. And this election came very close uh, to being a perfect electoral process. Um, it was, it was almost humiliating to everybody collectively that at the last minute one of the actors who pulled the rock from under everybody's feet. Um, I think that explains some of the frustration and the reason why people said it was so blatant, it was right in your face, we have to draw the line somewhere. Um, now the data also as Akwe said, um, that was one factor that has kind of emboldened or gave a lot of backbone to, to some of the actors. Uh, that explains why the issue of a uh, government of uh, national unity um, a la Zimbabwe or Kenya model was rejected very early on by the Ivorians because they said in those two previous cases, people couldn't really say what the outcome was. There was some doubt, but in Cote d'Ivoire, everybody had their statistics on the outcome of the elections. The political parties, to their credit, um, had poll watchers in the polling sites, and they were doing their own independent tabulation of the outcome. Uh, so the outcome of this election was really not in doubt. Um, and I think that even when the Constitutional Council throws out 600,000 votes uh, to bring from one of the candidates' constituencies, to bring that candidate to 49%, it's, it's very telling. It's obvious. You, it's not rocket science. You just see it. Now, in terms of the future, what does this mean for the elections in, Ug in Uganda, in Egypt, in the DRC, and in other countries? Um, as I said, African Democrats are watching this very closely. Uh, it was very interesting last night, uh, for some of you who may have stayed up late to watch um, uh, the president of Tunisia, Ben Ali, on, on TV, saying, I promise you, I'm going to give you all the liberty you want, and I'm going to give you all the democracy, <laughs> and I will not be president in 2014, and there's no live presidency in Tunisia. People are watching this very closely. 
Um, and I tell you that if this gets resolved in a way that re reassures Africans that their voices should be heard and must be heard through electoral processes, that's going to enhance the prospects for better elections going forward. Can I just add something? Yeah. Yeah, I, I did not intend in my answer to let Western governments off, so off the hook quite so easily. I mean, I think if I, if I uh, look back at uh, Ethiopia, as, as, as was mentioned, or I look ahead to the upcoming uh, election in Uganda in a, in, a, in a few weeks' time, I'm pretty unhappy, actually, about the level of critique uh, from the US side. And I don't think anything uh, particularly excuses that. I think it's, you know, people, uh, governments have uh, interests and, you know, when it's very important not to offend somebody or not to destabilize some other project, then they back off. And it's nothing that's happened means that we don't need to keep holding people's feet to the fire. And it's certainly not only the US government. And I think, I'm, you know, I, 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 I'm sure that I'm not the only one who's enormously appreciative of some of the strength of, of, of uh, opinion that's come out of the US government. And indeed, that key speech that Obama made in, the, in Accra, which has been taken as a template for so many uh, uh, subsequent engagements and arguments, even where they haven't been won. I think everybody's very appreciative of the things that were said then. But it, at the same time, you know, I don't think that you're good, it's going to be, you know, that, you know, uh, democracy and, uh, on, on everybody's behalf is breaking out all over and then we will never have any more, you know, doubts about kind of convictions on African elections. So I think we will be, you know, it will be business as usual again in another setting uh, and there will be arguments. But on this one, for a variety of reasons, there has been a kind of alignment, a strange alignment of the stars that has allowed for uh, coordination. Yeah, I think on, on the U.S., um, obviously, we have probably less complex relationships with Cote d'Ivoire than we do in Rwanda and Ethiopia. And that, um, and, um, and so for obvious reasons, I, I think probably, you know, we, we could do much more in those instances. Um, but the key in this one, too, was the, the potential leverage that we had once ECOWAS and the African Union stepped up. Um, in, in Rwanda, you got to think in a lot of those countries, you know, the U.S. doesn't have that kind of leverage. Even in this instance where you have the whole international community behind you and the U.N. Security Council, including the Chinese and Russians behind you, ECOWAS, the African Union, we're seeing really the limits of leverage in a situation like this. Much less so when the international is commu uh, community is divided, when African leadership is ambivalent in a place like Zimbabwe, for example, um, and you, you didn't hear African leadership speaking up uh, against very flawed elections, you know, across in, in a lot of other instances. And, and I think this is an opportunity, you know, for the U.S. to, to, to you know, it sees it as having greater leverage in this because of this uh, unanimity. Let's take another round of questions, but we won't forget Elliot's questions about kind of what's the next way forward. Who's pointing? Oh, I'm sorry that I'm like exactly. Is it just you here? Okay. Oh, and 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 Jason. Okay, Jason, we'll get your response in the next round. I'm really not doing a very good job here. Let's <laughs> let's go with the gentleman here, the gentleman in the far back, um, and we'll sorry we'll go to the uh, the lady back here. Good morning, um, Omar Aruna Goodwatch International. Uh, going back to Chris. Uh, point uh, 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 in relation to uh, recognizing uh, the voice of the Ivorian uh, with regard to what is going on and with regard to the election. Uh, my question is based on uh, Babo's uh, propaganda rhetoric. Obviously, there is, uh, 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 he has a support, supporters. And uh, based on the result from uh, uh, the right, uh, uh, I would say, based on the right results, he's have at least 40% of the vote. And uh, following uh, also uh, his uh, uh, rhetoric, he probably was able to rise a few other people. Won't we be going back to the pre-election situation where uh, we had two armies face to face and Bagbo is, uh, uh, governing and now in a, a reverse mode if uh, Watara is able to really effectively assume his position. If it is the case, uh, how can we prevent situation be, uh, uh, that will also get us back uh, into a situation where we'll be talking about election in five years in the same situation? 
Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to, uh, yeah, we had the question back here. If you could keep the question quite brief because we're a bit short on time. So a microphone to the back, yeah, okay. Hello, thanks, Jennifer. This is Nyaka Lagoke from the Ivory Coast. Uh, I had a few questions, but just uh, if you could limit it to one. <laughs> oh, can I can I uh, can I make a comment instead? Can a, I? A, a brief, a very brief. No one. problem. Okay, my comment is going to be on the military intervention in the Ivory Coast. I said that already on different shows. Uh, I believe that uh, Mr. Watara is not right when he's talking about the military intervention, and then. Ivory Coast, like I said, is the microcosm of a united Africa. So when you go and you allow a military force to go in Ivory Coast to try and remove somebody from power, I, I presume that uh, it is not the right way to approach this crisis because many people have said it. Nobody knows uh, you know, the effects of that military intervention. So next time, my suggestion to you, when you organize those kind of fora, I suggest that you listen to different voices because since the beginning of the runoff, we've been, I have been attending those con conferences and we've been hearing the same voices. And I think that in the, in the name of democracy, it is good to invite other people so that we can have a better discussion. Thank okay. you. Thank you for that comment. Um, and then the lady here. Um, this question is for Jade. Hello. Can you hear me? Um, uh, last month, the World Bank uh, froze funding to Cote d'Ivoire. This week, we saw the Global Fund cut off most aid. Cut off most aid, and there are some rumblings that France is considering some sort of cocoa sanctions. How seriously is the U.S. Um, taking this option, going beyond targeted sanctions and imposing economic sanctions at large? Is it even being discussed? Okay, let's turn to Jason. You have the Angola question, the compatibility of the lists, and this last question. Okay. Um, first, on, on financial sanctions, well, sanctions writ large, um, the, the U.S. list, first of all, on, on travel sanctions is actually quite extensive. Um, and in, in fact, the, the decision is, is flexible, so we, names can be added fairly, fairly easily to that, to that list. So on travel sanctions, um, we can make it very clear that, that you know, those who are, who are supporting uh, uh, Magbo are, are not welcome in the United States. Um, on, on the asset freeze question, that's a little more complicated. Uh, uh, I'm not from the U.S. Treasury Department, but they are the ones who have to follow U.S. law when it comes to economic sanctions, um, particularly related to individual asset freezes. Um, we've done five. That does not mean that's the end of the list. There may be other names out there that we're considering, um, and, and certainly there are means by which we can go ahead and add to that list. So, so certainly there are, there are continued talks about, about how, we can, how we strengthen our, our sanctions regime. Um, on, uh, on broader economic sanctions, I mean, you heard what President Watara said about uh, broader economic sanctions. You know, he's very concerned about the effect on the Ivorian people, as, as are we and as are our European partners. And so we consider, continue to consult on those issues, but uh, as we said, no option is off the table, certainly, in this situation. Um, and then finally, I think uh, uh, Angola, yes. We're talking to Angola on a regular basis. We know that they have influence um, with, with Bagbo and others, um, and that, that is a, a big, major uh, 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 country that we continue to talk to. Uh, in fact, at the AU summit, which is coming up the end of this month, um, Cote d'Ivoire is expected to be a major piece of the discussion that will happen bilaterally among all of the, uh, the representatives that are there. And then uh, finally, I think the, the actual other constituencies um, that are out there that may have uh, in influence, or as we like to say, personal persuasion, perhaps, on uh, President, uh, former President Bagbo. Uh, yes, there are certain uh, individuals who we've been in contact with who uh, some have asked that they not be publicly named, but have tried to uh, contact Bagbo and to ur urge him to do the right thing in this situation. So yes, all tools at our disposal are, we're, we're trying to pull together and, and nothing is off the table. Thank you. Le le no, let's, <coughs> let's wrap up with comments from our two, and I think it goes to this question and to the gentleman um, with a comment on the military intervention and really the division of opinion in Cote d'Ivoire. And there's, there's not one Ivoirian view, and, and, uh, and it is, I, I think, 
you know, that's something that the next Ivoirian government is going to have to deal with as well. So maybe we conclude this with a little, some thoughts on kind of the, the future in Cote d'Ivoire and that bigger reconciliation process that's going to have to unfold however this immediate crisis plays out. Akwe, do you want to start on that? Sure. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I think it's a short-term, long-term problem. People, understandably, don't want to take action economically that's going to leave people suffering. I think anybody who's, you know, watched the process of wars in the Mano River area uh, knows that there's a great deal more to be lost um, than, you know, some, you know, economic ground. And I think I was quite surprised to hear him, uh, you know, back off a little bit from the economic sanctions because it seems to me that if you're looking at the prospect, and I think we all recognize that it is a real prospect uh, of, of a revived civil war, then you're really going to want to, uh, you know, take on, take, take into consideration options which, you know, in a, on, a, on a normal day you wouldn't be open to, and it doesn't seem to me right at this point to be backing away from that. It seems to me that you ought to be saying, you know, what is the list of things that would really make a difference here? And, you know, I, I think some of those things are already in place and aren't yet effect effective. The financial sanctions piece, for example, I'm not at all surprised to, he to hear informally that some of the small states are thinking about their problems with uh, applying uh, financial sanctions against Cote d'Ivoire and about the backlash, or rather the, the blowback from uh, Cote d'Ivoire's economic problems if, if, if they go ahead with this, affecting them. And, you know, I, get, I think some sort of rigorous conversation within the community of states about whether it's better to take that pain in the short term uh, and avoid a much worse longer term situation just seems to be due at this point. Uh, it, it's, it's easy for an amateur on the sidelines like me to say that. But uh, I do, you know, as a journalist over the years, I've always been surprised when I finally get close to the heart of what's taken place behind the closed doors. I'm always surprised <laughs> at the lack of vision and the short term and pragmatic calculation that, you know, had it not been, had it not prevailed, would have allowed much worse situations to, uh, to be avoided. So I, that, that would be my reaction is that absolutely there should be a much tougher uh, mindset around financial sanctions and economic sanctions and isolation uh, and monitoring of those, those various pieces to make sure that if it has a chance to work, then that's by far, in my view, the best option for uh, Ivorian civilians. Yep. Yeah, um let me uh, conclude by probably taking on uh, Eliot's uh, response to Eliot's question and say, is there one person out there who may still be helpful? Um, I would say Dos Santos could be that person because he's one person that Babu listens to. Um, I, I imagine he's being talked to as well. The only unfortunate thing, though, is that uh, Dos Santos has been 19 years since he had his own presidential elections. <laughs> uh, so there may not be a personal incentive there to <laughs> tell his friend to do the right thing. But I think if there was enough leverage, especially if he is looking for opportunities to be viewed as a statesman, maybe he could weigh in and this issue will be resolved without further bloodshed, without further violations, gross violations of human rights. I think nobody's out there saying bomb Abidjan. Uh, nobody is saying the military should go in at full force and shoot at everybody. People are hoping that even though the military option is on the table, that we really don't get to that. And one way to resolve it is to have people like Dos Santos tell President Bagbo to do the right thing. I will just conclude with Omar's question, um, which is really where I started, uh, by saying that in terms of further polarization of Ivorian society, uh, I have confidence that the Ivorians can get, this, they can get their act together if this issue is resolved. And there are examples to draw upon in Ivorian society. Uh, for those of you who followed the whole debate about Ivoirite in the last decade, who would have believed that in the 2010 elections, Alassane Ouattara would have as his strongest ally, Henri Conan Bédier? <laughs> and it's because those two stuck together in the alliance of the RHDP that it became very difficult for the FPI to win presidential election in Cote d'Ivoire. And that reconciliation is taking place between the people who were arch rivals to the point where Ivory Ten nearly tore, tore apart the entire country. It happened. Also, uh, at the time when Gbagbo was in opposition, at one point, he and Alassane Ouattara were allies in the Front Republicain. 
the FBI and the RDR were allies in the Front Republican at the time against the PDCI. So there, there, that's, that's something to work with. And I think if the crisis is resolved in a way that reinforces fairness, justice, the credibility of elections, elections matter, democratic governance, I think there will be some room, especially as President-elect Alassane Ouattara has talked about national reconciliation, that if he continues to reach out, there will be room to kind of get all of this together so Cote d'Ivoire can move uh, forward in a way that will give Ivorians a sense that their investment in democratic governance is paying off and also help embold, uh, in, uh, strengthen other nascent democracies in the sub-region that seem to depend on Cote d'Ivoire because of its economic and political might. Chris, thank you very much. Thank you to you all for joining us today, really, and thank you to NDI uh, and to OSI and to U.S. Institute of Peace for co-sponsoring this. Um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll hope to come perhaps together again um, in the coming months. Um, but I, I, please join me in thanking Akwe and Chris. And thank you. Thank you.